Good afternoon. My name is Jason, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Building a Culture of Health for Native Americans through Nursing Culture and Community Engagement Conference Call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. If you should need assistance during the call, please press star zero on your telephone keypad, and an operator will come back to assist you. Dr. Winfred Quinn, Director of Advocacy and Consumer Affairs at the Center to Champion Nursing in America, you may begin your conference call. Oh, thank you so much, Jesse, and good afternoon and welcome to all. Thank you for taking the time to join us for today's webinar. This is uh, part of a series of webinars highlighting members of the Campaign for Action, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Steering Committee, and features the work of the National Alaska Native American Indian Nursing Association, or Nana Aina. Nana Aina is an important member of our Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Steering Committee. It was founded in 1993 with the mission of uniting, uniting American Indian, Alaska Native nurses, and others who care for American Indian, Alaska Native people to improve the health and well-being of the people. Before we go any further, I do want to mention that we are recording today's webinar. So if you miss a section or would like to pass it on to a colleague, which we highly recommend you do, you can find the recording by going to www.campaignforaction.org backslash webinars. And now I'm delighted to introduce you to one of our facilitators for the webinar, Dr. Lisa Martin. Dr. Martin is the immediate past president of Nana Aina, and is an assistant professor with St. Catherine University in St. Paul, Minnesota. She is a member of the Lac du Flambeau Band of Chippewa Indians in Wisconsin. Lisa began her academic career at the University of Minnesota as a research assistant with the Center for Adolescent Nursing and as a science administrator with the American India, Indian Alaska Native um, Masters in Science to PhD Nursing Science Bridge Project established to double the number of Alaska American Indian nurses with PhD degrees in the US. Prior to the University of Minnesota, Lisa worked as a public health nurse in inner city areas and as a clinical educator, nursing supervisor, and project manager with several interdisciplinary public health programs. Dr. Martin's areas of interest include diabetes prevention in American Indian youth, holistic nursing, and integrative healthcare and cross-cultural competence. Dr. Martin has several years of experience teaching undergraduate and graduate nursing. In addition to Dr. Martin's passion for teaching, she has experience building research partnerships with American Indian communities. Her doctoral dissertation described the experiences of American Indian adolescents living with type 2 diabetes. Her current work uh, research looks closely at American Indian youth living with overweight, obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. Dr. Martin. Thank you, Wynne, and uh, boujou, and hello, and Ojibwe um, to everyone, and I would like to welcome everyone joining in today's webinar. I'm Lisa Martin, of the immediate past president of Nana Aina, and a member of the Lac de Flambeau Band of Chippewa Indians in Wisconsin, and I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, Nana Aina has been a partner over the past year with the AARP and the Future of Nursing Campaign for Actions Native American Nursing Learning Collaborative to sponsor this series of webinars on Native American nursing. So as it is described on the campaign's website, um, these webinars are a first attempt to address important topics to improve the well-being of Native communities and address health inequities through nursing. We know truth, true health begins with respect for the values within the Native community, and well-being and equity must involve the leadership and involvement of those in the community who hold that knowledge and wisdom. 
This collaborative webinar approach reflects the concept of cultural humility, which includes self-reflection and a commitment to lifelong learning. I am now very pleased to introduce to you the incoming president for Nana Aina, Sandy Littlejohn, and I would also like to introduce the facilitator for today's webinar, Dr. Regina Eddy. Sandy is Madawakadan Dakota and grew up on the Lower Sioux Reservation, located near Morton, Minnesota. She's been in the nursing profession for 36 years and Sandy completed her bachelor's in nursing at St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota, and her master's of arts in transcultural nursing at Augsburg College in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Sandy's nursing career has spanned long-term care, clinic, and hospital care settings, as well as human resources. While at Gunderson Health System in La Crosse, Wisconsin for the past 27 years, Sandy has taken on a variety of leadership roles across the health system, including 10 years as the Executive Director of Hospital Operations. Her current role is Executive Consultant in Human Resources. Sandy has been an active contributor for many academic, state, and national nursing initiatives related to diversity and Native American nursing priorities. She's committed to fostering the next generation of nurses and healthcare leaders by mentoring students and colleagues as they discover their professional path in healthcare. Sandy has served two terms as a board member of Nana Aina and currently represents Nana Aina as the treasurer of the National Coalition of Ethnic Minority Nurses Association, also known as ENSINA. Sandy was honored to have co-authored with her dear friend, Dr. the late Dr. Roxanne Struthers, a publication titled The Essence of Native American Nursing in 1999. I would like to also introduce our facilitator today, Dr. Regina Eddy, who is an assistant professor at Northern Arizona University School of Nursing. She's an enrolled member of the Navajo Diné Nation, rooted in culture, tradition, and work, has worked for many years, serving her Navajo community as a public health nurse and program director. Dr. Eddy received her PhD in nursing from the University of New Mexico in 2017. She is a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Nursing and Health Policy Collaborative Fellow and is a diversity consultant for the Center to Champion Nursing in America. I'm pleased to make these introductions, and I'd like to now turn things over to Sandy Littlejohn for a few additional comments on Nana Aina. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Martin, and I extend a warm greeting to each of you on this webinar. I'm honored to be representing the National Alaska Native American Indian Nurses Association also referred to as Nana Ina for the coming year. Some of you may be familiar with Nana Ina, so I would just take a moment to review our purpose and mission. And as Wynne said earlier, we are a committed group of individuals from across the country, and we are dedicated to the health and well-being of American Indian Alaska Native people. We're vested in raising the health of our people and to advance our profession. Wopira to Marcella Lebeau, who will be sharing her nursing journey with us today. We have much to learn from our elders to guide us in our lives. Lastly, I would extend a sincere thank you to our partners, AARP, the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation, and our colleagues at the Center to Champion Nursing in America. Their commitment to lifting up the voice of Native nurses is very much appreciated. A wopida, thank you in Dakota. I would now like to turn things over to Dr. Eddy to introduce our speaker today. Good afternoon, everyone. I have the distinct honor to introduce in our guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Marcella Lebeau. Uh, she is a member of the Two Kettle Band of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe and is the great granddaughter of Chief Joseph Forbear, who was a signer of the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. Dr. LeBeau is a retired nurse, and she served in the Army Nurse Corps during World War II as First Lieutenant. 
She's a public speaker, often sharing her nursing history with requests for presentations from groups of veterans, students, and others. She was honored to serve as a Cheyenne River <clears throat> Tribal Council member for four years and was instrumental in leading smoking cessation efforts on her reservation. Marcella is an active member of the CRS Tribes Wisdom Keepers Board. Her favorite things to do is to shop for fabric and creating star quilts for a special occasion. In May of 2018, she received an honorary doctorate in public service from South Dakota State University. Before turning this over to Dr. LeBeau, I want to acknowledge that throughout Native American tribal communities, there is a tradition of respect and honoring of our elders. For me, out of respect, I'd like to explain a little bit of context on Dr. LeBeau's behalf. First, this is only her second webinar, and this, is, <clears throat> this way of sharing her story through this webinar is new and different for her. So thank you, Dr. LeBeau, for your willingness to be with us today. And just to remind you, and I apologize ahead of time, but just as we prepare, I will interject at the last 10 minutes of the webinar for you to answer a set of questions. So I hand it off to you, Dr. LeBeau. Okay, thank you. This is Marcella LeBeau from Cheyenne River at Eagle Butte, South Dakota. And um, when I was working as a nurse in Eagle Butte at our little hospital, 27-bed hospital, we could see the escalation of diabetes and alcoholism. And I want to take you back in time to my great-grandfather, Forbear, who signed the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. At that time, he was required to live on the northeast corner of our reservation and put away his Indian ways and live by the Fort Laramie Treaty. And if you look at pictures of people back then, they, you didn't see any obesity as we do see nowadays. And the diet changed. He used to be a provider for his people, hunt the buffalo, which provided their food and the hides for their clothing, and they weren't obese. From then, his diet changed, and he could no longer hunt and provide for his people. They took away his role as a provider, and I always think to myself how humiliating that must have been for him not to be able to provide for his people. I saw a huge log at the museum in Timberlake, and it gave a list of all those who received rations, and his name was on that list. So their diet changed, and we're learning today that that diabetes, let's see, that the first case of diabetes was reported in 1919. So however many years that took to become diabetic. And on our reservation now today, OB, uh, diabetes is at epidemic proportions. And then further, if you go back to the doctrine of discovery way back, when foreigners came onto our land thinking that all of this land was free and open. And I suspect that was when the Cherokee were chased out on the Trail of Tears, moving this way, this way to our land. And then came along the Dawes Act, which took more land, the, the Homestead Act, which took more land, and then the Citizenship Act, which also took more land. And my great-grandfather was given land on the northeast corner of our reservation. And that was already treaty land. It was already our land. But they gave him an allotment, and he had to live there and stay there. If he left the reservation, he had to have a signed permit to come and to go. 
And if he didn't have that, he would have been shot as a hostile, although the Fort Laramie Treaty was considered a peace treaty. So things changed for us then. And now today, our people are experiencing an epidemic of diabetes and alcoholism and now meth and other other issues. So from, from there, we also had to go to boarding schools. And boarding schools were traumatizing to us as children. And some of them were severely punished because they couldn't speak their the English language. If they spoke their own language, that was taken from us. Our hair was cut. And they, without our permission, all of these traumas were facing the results of today and we're learning. I went to a workshop, a conference in Carlisle, Pennsylvania this year. And they talked about the traumas that our people have experienced. And now they're telling us to deal with those traumas that have left us in the condition that we live in today, that we should talk about it, tell about it, write about it. And so that that is something, well, maybe not new so much, but something, a way in which we can help ourselves and perhaps overcome some of the issues that are facing our reservations today. And with that, I think I would like to turn it over to someone. Okay, next slide, maybe. Huh? The next slide? Tell about your nursing, the start of your nursing. In, in the Army? This is your graduation picture from here. We, we went to the boarding school at the Old Shine Agency, and there we were got the message that we didn't have the wisdom or the ability to be more than a secretary, a housewife, a maid, you know, some other. So we weren't encouraged to go on for further education. My sister went to went to Haskell Institute to be a secretary because that's what we were supposed to be. And it was there that she got her education, and World War II broke out, so they wanted secretaries in Washington, D.C., so she went to Washington, D.C. as a secretary. And then while she was there, later down the road, they offered nurse, nurse cadet corps training in the Army, so she accepted that. She wanted it to go into World War II as I was had signed up for a nurse to World War II. Then I'd like the next like the next slide. That's still when I'm a nurse in World War Two. I went to work after my nurse's training at a little hospital in Fort Thompson, uh, I was offered this job by one of my patients when I was in training. He happened to be a friend of my mother's. So when I graduated, I took that job and my friend Marie went with me. There was a young doctor there and he kept saying to us, you girls are young, you have an education why don't you go on and 
go out and see the world. We listened to that for a while. Then we went, we saw in a nursing magazine, they offered a job in Pontiac, Michigan. So we accepted that. And then they, there, we heard every day on the radio the need for nurses in the Army, in the military. So we decided that we would sign up for the Army Nurse Corps, which we did. We each had the opportunity to put down another's name that we wanted to go into the service with. So I put Marie's name down. She put my name down. She went to Colorado in the Pacific, and I went to California in the Atlantic. We had no choice after we signed up. We knew the Army was in charge. So that began our career in nursing. And to make a long story short, I went to Boston, left on the USS George Washington, a 5,000 troop ship, to Liverpool, England. And there we... There we went to Wales, to Landudno, Wales, for a few weeks, and we were billeted in private homes. From there, we went to Little Minister, England, and we set up a barracks-type hospital there, preparing for a D-Day. When D-Day happened, we began, D-Day happened on June 6, 1944, and on the 7th, we received our first convoy of patients. They had been treated in field hospitals before they came to us. Most of them were sent back to the United States for further care. Then in August, when it was safe, we were ordered to cross the English Channel into France. We landed at Utah Beach, climbed down a rope ladder into a into a landing barge. We stayed in the cow pasture there for a time. I believe it was several weeks. And we were told not to venture out on, in the area because of landmines, possible landmines. We saw the German pillboxes that were knocked out. And we saw that some uh, machine guns that were also disabled. Then we were taken up to to Paris, France. Along the way, we saw the rubble at Saint Lô that where the Germans had destroyed their the buildings, the area. We were there in. Uh, Paris, France, at the hundred and I think it was the hundred and fourth General Hospital, the Americans had taken over the hospital from the Germans, and I have a picture with the swastika flag hanging outside the hospital. It was wartime, so we didn't get to go out. There was one evening, then we went out for dinner and. Uh, saw one of the shows there, the Follies. From there we went to, they took us to Liege, Belgium. Which Who? Okay, this is. This is the hospital in Liege, Belgium. It was a thousand bed tent hospital. And my ward was A number one, which was the first ward, and it was a surgical ward right across from the surgery. At first, they had a tent set up for the surgeons, but they preferred to do surgery in a wooden building, so they they built that for them. Along the way, we visited some uh, vacated ca- castle, and I picked up some Christmas decorations. So I took a, a wire hanger 
and I made a Merry Christmas and decorated my door at my ward. I don't know if others had Christmas decorations, but it was wartime, and we had... We didn't have much for Christmas that year. We we were in the area where the Germans had overtaken the Americans. I know we heard later at a 60 mile wide line and they were headed for the port of Antwerp and we were in between. So our hospital would have been taken over if the Americans hadn't recovered their their line. But we were just told at that time to be to be packed and ready to be evacuated on a moment's notice. And we could feel the concussion of the ACAC on the ground. It was so strong. And also we heard the 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 machine machine guns traveling down the the cobblestone streets in Liege hour after hour. And there were times when they could, the Germans would drop flares and light up the night sky like day. We were told that they were looking for troop movements. But we didn't know really much, much what was going on as far as the war was concerned. But we were busy in our wards. We gave many, many blood transfusions. We never ran out of blood that we needed. And at that time, penicillin was new. And so we had a penicillin team that would go around every four hours and give their their shots, penicillin shots. And we had all the supplies that we needed. Our patients came and went rapidly, some say overnight, on their way back to the United States to be evacuated. One time, there was a little Dutch soldier that joined the American Army, and he brought came up to my desk. I had a little bulletin board, and he said, the Americans have pinup girls, and I want to be your pinup boy, and he put his picture up on my board. But we were so busy, and I I spent my tour of night duty on the shock ward, or either that or my own ward. There was one time when there was I heard this noise. I was working night duty on my new ward. I heard this noise. So I went to the door and looked out, and I saw this plane coming. It was... It was uh, shooting both sides as they came and it came over the nurses area and then shortly after that here came my tent mate Esther it had hit our tent and she picked up the shrapnel that made the hole in our tent and she brought it over to me to show me she held it in the palm of her hand and she must have been really scared. She said she was taking a bath and she didn't have any clothes on. She was naked. And she said, I don't care if this war lasts 10 years, I'm never taking another bath. And then much later, after the war, we had reunions in Des Moines, Iowa, every June. And we met there. So I told the story about the shrapnel that Esther brought And she didn't remember a thing about it. And I suspect that she might have been in shock because she was really scared. So anyway, at one time when the war was... uh, You can have him advance. I'm sorry? Have him advance it. Tell him to go with a slide ahead. Oh, can you? Oh, okay. We had a chapel on our compound, and on December, let's see, 
December 25th, Chaplain Butterworth, he had a Chris, he had a prayer, Christmas prayer service. So Esther and I went to the little chapel, and a buzz bomb came over, and the soldiers that were there, they they hit the floor. But we sat there through the whole thing, and there were times when you couldn't even hear Captain Butterworth pray because of the buzz, buzz bomb noise. And then after the war, we saw a map, and there were there were 3,000 buzz bombs that hit the Liege area. And the, I was given this map, and there was a little arrow showing the one that hit our tent area. When it hit, when it hit our area, it hit the area where the military police were getting ready for bed. It was in the morning, and I was had worked night duty, and I was going back to my tent to get some sleep. There was a nurse that was coming from that military police area, and she was crying. She said. Don't go there. She said, it's awful. You see limbs. And she went on. She was crying. She said, don't go there. They're going to need you tonight. You better get some sleep. So I listened to her, and I went to my tent to get some sleep. There were three of us in our tent, Esther and Betty and I. Next slide. After the war, I, my daughter Kathy and I took a trip to Paris, France, and to Liège, Belgium. We flew into Paris, and then we took a train up to Liège, Belgium. And we were looking for the plaque that was made to honor the 25 men who were killed. So I went to this information counter in Liège, Belgium, and I was telling this man what I was looking for. And there was a man came up on my right, and he said, Lady, because of you, we are free. Thank you. And he left. And then on the other side, there was a lady sitting on a bench and came over, and she offered to take us any place we wanted to go. Took us to the Henry Chappelle Cemetery, where the military, some military police, were buried. And a man by the name of Jacinti, he showed me the log, and I found the names of the 25 men who had been killed by the buzz bomb. They were all identified except for one. He was considered missing in action. After the war then, next slide. After the war then, uh, when I came back to the United States, Desenti told me, he said, if you send me pictures I'll try to find out where your hospital was located. And so I did that. And he provided me with lots and lots of pictures he found where our hospital had been. And there was a transportation company that had built up there. And when he told them about the plaque that I was looking for, they reconstructed it from the pictures I sent. And they made a semicircular area outside their transportation company uh, dedicated to these 25 men. And one of the men from our reunion in Des Moines, he went with his family there, and he found that area and brought us back pictures. And he could hardly tell the story. He was so choked up with emotion. Next slide.
so af- shortly after the war was over, they were sending two nurses at a time to go to the Riviera for a rest period. I didn't think that I needed to go, but we were ordered. So Betty and I went to the Riviera, and we could wear civilian clothes if we had them. But I had a, a robe that I cut off and made it into a dress so that I could wear, had something different to wear while we were there. And the people there, they thought we were French and spoke to us in French. There was Betty and I. Then when the war was over, we were sent back to the United States according to the point system. And some of the nurses had been in there in the army much longer than I had been, so they got to come home first. And Betty was one of them. So when we came back to the United States, we were told that some of the GIs got down on the ground and they kissed the ground. They were so happy to be back. Next slide. We lost track of Betty. She she got married after she came back and changed her name. So we lost her. So we we finally located her in Idaho. So Esther and I, we went to visit her in Idaho. So that's the picture of the three of us after the war. Next slide. Then in Eagle Butte, back in Eagle Butte, there was a lady, oh, her name was Cameron. She came to Eagle Butte and was doing a work uh, therapy for veterans, and she learned about my military history. So she happened to be in Washington, D.C., <coughs> and she gave my information there when they were selecting 100 for veterans to receive the French Legion of Honor Medal. So that was how that started for me. My name was presented by her. So I had the honor and privilege of going to Paris and France. My daughter and her husband went with me that time. That was one of the most awesome experiences of my life. The French really know how to put on an honor like they did. I can't begin to tell you all of the things that happened there. We had dinners, lunches, and teas, and we they took us down by bus to Normandy, and I was, um, before I went through my daughter Jerry's workplace, there was a man named Don, and he wanted me to say a prayer, a silent prayer for his father and his best friend who was wounded at, at uh, Omaha Beach when they during the invasion of Paris. Next slide. Uh, I usually tell a story here about the man who wanted me to see a silent prayer at Omaha Beach. Not a, and I do have that with me, but I, I can't see it right now. It's on there. Next slide. Maybe it's on there. And the next slide. The next slide. Now, dear, came back to the questions. 
Marcella, are you looking for the prayer? Is that what you're? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, let me see, Scott. Yes. It's it's on the um the screen now. There now. So I'll I'll finish by reading the prayer. This is the 60th anniversary of D-Day, June 6, 2004. This man named Don back in in uh, Spearfish, South Dakota, he asked uh, my daughter if I would say a prayer at Omaha Beach if I could get there. His his father and his best friend made it the invasion on D-Day, and his best friend was wounded. So he called for the medic for his friend, and he never saw him again till after the war. And after the war, he learned that he had a severe head, head injury, but he recovered. And so he asked if I would say a prayer there at Omaha Beach. And this I will read my prayer on the 60th anniversary of D-Day, June 6, 2004. O Great Spirit, guide my steps on this path to Omaha Beach. Guide my hands as I collect sand from this hollowed ground. Great Spirit, accept now my prayer for the brave and courageous soldiers who saw the horrors of war here this day, 60 years ago, June 6, 1944. Great Great Spirit, please accept my prayer for Lieutenant Harry Bailiot, Sergeant George Schweitzer, and all other soldiers. Next. Great Spirit, keep us ever mindful of the great sacrifices made to liberate France and to bring peace to our world by these valiant men. Next. O Great Spirit, now hold my hand and walk with me up the cliff of Omaha Beach. Filled with emotion no words can ever accept, express. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hat, Dr. LeBeau, yes. for your many contributions, beginning with, first and foremost, your service to our country and how your work continued after the war, especially with your commitment to your communities and being an advocate for your communities and your people. It is a true honor to hear what you just shared with us. Um, I honestly will say uh, you are the first I have ever heard of a Native American woman, um, a Native American nurse serving and helping um, in World War II. I mean, this is a history today. This is a history in the making, as we just heard your story. <clears throat> Throughout Indian country, it seems like many of our um, Native, Native American elders who served in World War II were men. Um, my, my grandfather uh, served in the World War II, and he received a Purple Heart for his service. Um, but as I understand today, um, he never spoke of a word um, of his experience um, at war, because culturally in the Navajo Dine culture, it wasn't allowed for him to share or talk about. So thank you, um, Hihat, Dr. LeBeau, for sharing uh, with what you what you have with us today. Um, so with with what time we have left, um, we wanted to spend a little bit time with a set of questions. Um, you know, with you. Uh, being our elder and, you know, we look to you for your wisdom, advice, perspectives, and you began to answer um, some of the questions at the beginning of your presentation, um, certainly um, acknowledging um, how, I mean, the way of life has changed, uh, I think, for Indian people. And you mentioned uh, how even like the diets, um, the, the diets change and how, you know, today, because of that, too, you know, we, throughout Indian country, you know, we have one of the highest uh, diabetes rates. 
as you mentioned, um, heart disease, and even cancer rates, cancer rates as well. So I think um, what what I wanted to ask of you, I mean, just kind of you shared a little bit about how, um, you know, early on um, you were you were told, um, you know, that jobs, you know, for you, you know, when you were young, you know, uh, typical jobs that, that were going to be available for you were going to be like a, a secretary or a maid. But, you know, somewhere, somehow, you know, for you, you know, you chose to uh, pursue higher um, ambitions. And I think um, the question that I have, you know, today, uh, we have, um, you know, one of our challenges is we're trying to get more Native American um, students interested in nursing and, I mean, even health professions in general, um, even, you know, doctors, medical doctors. So I guess my question then would be, um, you know, for you, when you were told, you know, that you can only be a secretary or however it was told to you, what, what inspired you to get an education? What inspired you to become a nurse? Dr. LeBeau. I guess I, I, do, I don't know that I can put my finger on any one thing, but um, I lost my mother when I was 10 years old, and she was, uh, they said she had a tumor, uh, and I they said it was a benign tumor in her abdomen, but they couldn't do anything for her, so she passed away you know, when I was 10. And she was such a gracious woman. And I remember one time we were both in the hospital. I had my tonsils removed, and she called for me during the night for a glass of water. So I took her water, and she was always so gracious and kind. And just the ability to, to help someone who needed someone, something. Uh, other than that, I don't know that there is any one particular thing, because at the boarding school we were supposed to be more than, you know, like I said, secretary. And, but your father and, encouraged your education. And uh, we weren't supposed to be more than that. We didn't have the ability, the capability, but I had a father who was Irish, and he always said to us, get a good education, no one can take that away from you, but we had to go to the boarding school, and there we went to school half a day, and we worked half a day, so we didn't get the full education that others were getting, but in spite of that, you know, we, we did go on to school. And I think it was because of the encouragement from my father. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. And then on the screen, um, I'm going to jump ahead to uh, the last question. Um, so, you know, I was sharing with you last week, you know, and how, and how uh, Winifred Quinn opened um, the webinar today. I mean, we've been featuring different um, Native American nurses, nurse leaders, and um, they're, um, I guess, raising awareness uh, about Native American health issues and, you know, uh, talking about, you know, what our challenges are. So I guess the question I have is, you know, the, the last question, you know, what what words of wisdom, you know, would you offer to Native American uh, nurse leaders or nurses, and you know, considering you know, with all the challenges that that we have to face, you know, through Native American health, and then even um, getting more Native American uh, students interested in nursing. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, for myself, I think nursing is one of the greatest privileges and honors of person can get, the satisfaction you receive from helping others is something that you carry throughout your life and are grateful for that opportunity to help someone else. And the need is so great in our, our communities now after all of the traumas that we have faced through our, our lives and especially the boarding schools 
where we went just half a day and worked half a day. And I know of one instance where when I went to St. Mary's School of Nursing in Pier for a diploma nurse, there was a lady from our reservation came too, so there were two of us Native Americans there, and they gave us a pile of uh, textbooks. They were thick textbooks. And she looked through her textbooks, and the first ride she was gone, she never came back again. And it must have scared her or intimidated her to the point that she didn't think she could do it. And that partly because of the influence we had at the boarding school that we didn't have the wherewithal to be more than a housewife, a maid, or so on. Okay. Well, thank you again, Dr. Laveau. Um, thank you for every everything you shared with us, um, the history. And I'm going to turn it back over um, uh, to uh, Dr. Quinn or uh, Dr. Martin, Lisa Martin, for any uh, closing comments. Okay. Uh, this is um, Winifred, and um, uh, thank you for handing it back over, uh, Dr. Um, Eddie, and I uh, humbly and deeply thank um, Dr. LeBeau for the service you have provided uh, through your years. Um, I can't, I can barely talk. Uh, the prayer. Um, <clears throat> for the soldiers on D-Day and for serving them um, and for sharing your wisdom with us. <clears throat> so um, uh, thank you for, for all of that. Uh, in a mu much more than mundane <laughs> um, statement, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, if uh, you missed this section of the webinar or you would like to pass this on to your uh, network and loved ones, I highly and we highly encourage you to do so. Um, you will be able to find the recording of the webinar and a transcript um, probably next week sometime at www.campaignforaction.org backslash webinars. Um, please be sure to follow us on Twitter, on Facebook. You can sign up for our campaign update. Also, by going to the homepage of Campaign for Action, um, <clears throat> which is the slide that you see there, and you could um, click on whatever it is that you would like to uh, hear from us about. And um, and so, and Dr. LeBeau, I just. Uh, thank you uh, so deeply. I couldn't put the words out, but one of my uncles uh, was there on D-Day. Yes, you know, there are there more heroes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. This is Marcella. I'm saying that they are my heroes, all veterans. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And so are you. Yes, you sure so. are, Marcella. Thank you. Yeah. Um, doc, Dr. Martin or um, Ms. Littlejohn, anything else? Thank you, Dr. LeBeau, for your your words, for taking us back in time. This is Lisa Martin, and uh, I, I hear uh, just such wisdom in what we've talked about today and how it guides us in thinking about the future. And I'm just um, eternally grateful for your words and and um, sharing of experience today. Thank you. Miigwech. This is Marcella, and it's my honor to be with you all. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. So please join us for future. Bless you. Please join us for future um, um, 
webinars on our joint Native American Nursing Learning Collaborative that the Campaign for Action and Nana Aina host um, every quarter. Uh, we welcome everyone's participation and um, thank you. And please stay warm to everyone out there. I think this um, vortex is especially hitting our Native American nursing leaders who are all on the phone and on the webinar today. So please be very careful, take good care of yourselves, and um, we wish everyone the best of health. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. That concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.